Hey guys, welcome back to another Kubernetes video. Today we're going to be talking about the Kubernetes scheduler. This will be our first of a series of videos on the different components of the control plane where we will go into a little bit more depth. We've already done a overview of the control plane in Kubernetes and in this video we will start with the scheduler. So let's get right into it. So what does a scheduler do? It is the component that determines where in our cluster a pod can be run. It applies an algorithm to choose the best node that a pod should run on. Some considerations that the scheduler will take into account are resource availability, node health, and developer specifications. We will go into this in more detail as we move through. Those particular developer specifications can actually get quite complex, so we'll have individual videos on the developer spe specifications. However, on this particular video, we will focus on the actual algorithm itself that the scheduler uses to select nodes. Before we get to that, it is worth talking about this node name property. So in our pod specs, you will not have seen the node name property. And that is because the node name property is a hidden property generally when we're specifying pods. However, this particular property is one that is updated by the scheduler when the schedule, scheduler algorithm has completed and a node has been selected. We can also manually specify this node name property and give an, a node within our cluster. However, obviously we don't want to do that because the um, scheduler provides that functionality for us. We can do it for testing purposes and for curiosity's sake, but generally that will be done by the scheduler. So the scheduler identifies pods where the node name property is empty and then the scheduler algorithm is run. Without these steps, the pods remain in a pending state. So pods can be in various states um, throughout their life cycle, which we'll probably go into in a future video, but just understand that they will be pending if they do not get assigned a particular node. So now let's have a look at a couple of the details of the scheduling algorithm. The first thing to note is that we have a step in the schedule algorithm called filtering. This is where we find feasible nodes. So what are feasible nodes? No, feasible nodes are nodes on which a pod can be deployed. There are certain hard constraints that we'll have for a pod. For example, the resources required to deploy the pod. Any node that say, meets those resource requirements will be considered a feasible node. When we are finding the feasible nodes in a cluster that is deployed across multiple geographical availability zones, we will alternate through those availability zones. This allows us to deploy pods in a variety of locations and ensures that our overall cluster is in a, a highly available state so that we don't have all of our pods deployed on a particular um, availability zone within our HA cluster. The second broad step is scoring. This is when we take a little bit more of a nuanced approach to defining which node a pod should be deployed to and we find the node that is the best fit based on a, a broader set of criteria than we have used to, to filter the nodes in the prior step. When we are scoring nodes in a large cluster, we can define this property called percentage of nodes to score. So you could imagine the scoring algorithm can be quite a complex function that is run and there is some computational overhead there. So if we had a cluster with uh, 
hundreds or up to maybe a thousand nodes, then if we had to run that algorithm on every single node, then it would take a lot of time to schedule our pods. So that's why we may want to define this percentage of nodes to score property. That way we can cut down on the overhead of that scoring algorithm in terms of uh, you know, computing time and we will deploy our pods more quickly. And this of course is a balance because we want to find the best node but we also want to reduce that overhead for scheduling the nodes. So it really depends on the scenario that you're running. If it's super important to find the absolute best node, then you should probably increase this uh, percentage of nodes to score. If it's not as important and you want to deploy your pods quickly, you'll reduce it. The scheduler notifies the API server in a process called binding. So this is the last step of the scheduling algorithm. We actually have a YAML object that can be defined to bind a pod to a particular node, but this is uh, generally created um, automatically at the end of the scheduling cycle. So now, this is these are the, the steps that I have uh, talked about in the last step, except this is in a lot more depth. So. We see we have sort, pre-filter, filter, pre-score, filter, pre score, normalized score, reserve, permit, pre-bind, bind, and post-bind. And all of these steps are extensible to the user of the Kubernetes cluster. They come as default, but we can replace the logic that Kubernetes has defined with our own logic if we want to, if we have specialized requirements for how we want to schedule our pods. So let's have a quick look through each of these extension points individually. The first one is the sort extension point or Q sort. And this essentially determines how we order our pods that are waiting to be scheduled. So all of our pods that are to be scheduled will wait in a queue and as they reach the end of that queue, they will then begin the scheduling process. However, we can actually define how we want to order that queue as the pods are waiting to be scheduled, and that is a queue sort extension point. Then we have pre filter. With pre filter, we assess certain conditions of the pod and the cluster itself and if we get errors on the pre-filter stage we abandon the scheduling process so it essentially acts as a short circuit so that we don't have to run through filtering all of the nodes in our cluster and then to find out we have some kind of overall issue with the cluster that results in no node being available to schedule a pod then we have the actual filter algorithm itself. Here we will run, based on various criteria, as I mentioned before, we will run individual plugins. So the filter um, extension point may have multiple plugins. And for each of those, we have to, in order for a node to be considered feasible, as I mentioned before, for each plugin, we have to meet the criteria defined by that plugin. So it's like a big and condition you can think about it. So we have to come back at each point. We have to ensure that we've met the criteria defined by the filter. And finally, we have post filter. So in the case that the filter algorithm does not return any feasible nodes, we still have the potential to schedule the pod that we are trying to schedule. For example, if the pod we are trying to schedule is high priority and we are trying to schedule it onto a cluster where there are lower priority pods, then we can actually evict one of those lower priority pods and deploy our higher priority pod 
to a particular node. And that is one of the functions that post filter provides. It essentially allows us to deploy pods during certain conditions when we haven't actually found a feasible node in the filter stage. Now, the next five extension points are around scoring, reserving, and permitting. The first one is pre-score. Pre-score is essentially any preliminary work that needs to be done prior to the scoring algorithm being run. Generally, we, we use it to generate data, state data particularly, that is then fed into the scoring algorithm. Then we have scoring, which is executed via a set of plugins that are run sequentially. Each of those plugins will return a score. And then after we have that data, we run the normalized score extension point where we can actually modify the scores that we have returned relative to their importance um, and other criteria that we may define. Next is the reserve step. This step is essentially used to prevent race conditions. So if we are going to schedule a pod on a particular node, we want to mark that node and say there is a pod going on to this node. And that gives us protection against another pod being scheduled on that node prior to the binding actually taking place for the pod. Our next step then would be the permit stage. And this just allows us to provide some extra logic to either approve, deny, or delay the scheduling of the pod, which is done at the next step, which is the binding extension points. And our final three steps of the scheduling algorithm are pre-bind, bind, and post-bind. Pre-bind defines any work that needs to be done before the binding process. For example, mounting network volumes for the pod. The bind process is where the actual binding object is created. Once a binding object is created, then the kubelet on the node that is going to deploy the pod picks up the fact that the binding object has been created. It then contacts the container runtime, which goes away and provisions everything that we need for the new container to be deployed to our node. Finally, there is post bind, which is really just an informational extension point. It is used to clean up any resources that are left over after the binding process. And that is the in-depth scheduler algorithm. Um, we also will talk in the future about the scheduling API and how we can actually specify rules for how we want to deploy our pods. To give you a little overview of how this can be done, we have rules that can be applied at the node level. For example, node selector rules. If we define a node selector in our pod definition YAML file, this will select labels that exist on nodes within our cluster. And we will only deploy the pod to a node that contains the label that we have specified. Next, we can define which node we want to deploy our pod onto using node affinity or anti affinity. This gives us a more flexible way of defining which node we're going to deploy our pod. For example, we can create hard or soft rules. So we may wish to deploy our pod to a node that has an SSD, but that is not a hard rule. We can also define rules with affinity and anti-affinity 
that specify what existing pods are on our node. So there's a huge amount of functionality and flexibility that can be leveraged using affinity and anti-affinity, but we will get into that into in depth on a future video. Then there are pod topology constraints. So earlier in the video, we mentioned the possibility that a cluster may be deployed across different availability zones or regions globally. And this is a scenario where we'll have, that will allow us to have a highly available cluster. So if one of the availability zones goes down, we can still rely on the other availability zones. And pod topology constraints allow us to deploy pods and define how the pods are spread across different availability zones within our cluster. Finally, pod priority. We actually kind of gave a brief example of how this might work earlier in the video, but we can assign the level of priority that we want to particular pods. So how this would work is if we assign a high priority to a new pod that we are deploying to our cluster, we may actually evict an existing lower priority pod. And this is called preemption in Kubernetes where a pod is evicted for a higher priority pod. And again, we'll get into a lot more detail on all of these concepts in future Kubernetes scheduling videos. I really hope that was helpful for those who watched. Please leave a like and subscribe and I will talk to you in the next video.